On that fateful Tuesday of 27th October 1987, when Operation Lalang was launched, people began to disappear, mostly in the stealth of the night, in unmarked police cars. The Operation Lalang operators moved like snakes in the grass, and within two days, 55 people had been taken. On the third day, it was 63 detained. Because the operation was so clandestine, and the police, KG and the press fearful, it was difficult to ascertain the exact numbers being taken each day. However, the numbers quickly swelled to 109 within a fortnight. The Inspector General of Police, Tansri Hanif Omar, briefed the press on why the crackdown was necessary. He said that the situation in the country was tense, and if no immediate preventive measures were taken, the prevailing situation would undoubtedly bring about chaos. He claimed full responsibility for the action. He kept on stressing that it was a police action and that it was not politically motivated. On the same day, in Parliament, the Prime Minister, Dr. Mahathir Mohamed, elaborated on his reasons for the crackdown. He blamed certain people for attempting to create chaos and obstruct the government from carrying out its responsibility to maintain peace and stability. He said that the current situation had reached danger points, therefore preventive measures had to be taken to save the country from possible disaster. He said that the government could not wait until a riot had broken out before acting, and he cited the racial riots of May 13, 1969 as an example. He accused the opposition party leaders, especially the DAP, for blowing up racially sensitive issues. Critics and analysts of the country think otherwise. It was uh, concocted and conceived and conducted by the political masters, by the political rulers, Definitely not by the police. The police were just there to carry out the orders. I think it's a little bit hard to believe that it was just police action. You know? I think it's more political. Maybe there may have been a little bit of poli poli police element in the sense that they felt that things were getting out of control and maybe they would have to then uh, take something to keep things in control. But I think if you look at the consequences of what happened after the action, the way everything simmered down and almost all the prime ministers and government's problems seemed to be sorted out one after the other, I find very hard to accept that uh, explanation that there's police action. Well, our immediate comment is that uh, it is a political action. I do not think it was a mere police operation. There's a lot of evidence to show that it was politically motivated. The North-South Highway scandal, which uh, had gone to court just before the crackdown, the Amnu 11 case, which has also gone to court. These would be two of the most outstanding instances of um, events which were linked to crucial political developments. And I would suggest all the other things that had happened, the University of Malaya electives issue, the Chinese schools issue, all these issues had political undertones, and there's no way in which one could argue that it was not politically motivated. From all accounts, there was certainly an escalation of uh, racial sensitivities. In the months uh, preceding uh, October 87, and it is my impression that in the month of October 
itself, uh, there was a, a serious heightening of uh, such tensions, uh, culminating in a sense um, in the um, meeting to oppose the Ministry of Education's uh, um, decisions about the appointment of senior assistants in Chinese medium schools held at the uh, Tianho Chinese temple. There were unprecedented strains within the Amno leadership. Mahathir had not been a particularly popular leader, and feelings against him within Amno reached a pitch during a leadership contest held by the party in April 1987. In the struggle, Mahathir and his supporters, dubbed Team A, were opposed by a formidable array of some of Amno's leading luminaries, led by the former Minister for Trade and Industry, Tunku Razali Hamza. The so-called Team B of Tunko Razali had uh, come up with a legal challenge to, uh, to Mahadev's position. And this posed a really a very grave and real threat to his uh, political position, not only as Prime Minister of Malaysia, but also as Amno President. So it was very, very real. And, uh, his position was uh, highly insecure. He failed to unite uh, his own party. Uh, his uh, his opponent or his critics increased, and uh, his influence also went down. Uh, at the same time, as a prime minister, he has not shown uh, good image. The youth wing of Amno staged a rally at an open air stadium in Kuala Lumpur, urging the government not yield to the Chinese community protest and called for the expulsion of Lee Kim Sai from the cabinet. It is my impression that all these meetings were very highly charged racially and um, in the Amno Youth Rally in particular it is said that high, very provocative uh, sentiments were expressed in both in the speeches as well as in the um, posters and uh, banners which were exhibited in that meeting. Amno leaders then announced that a mammoth anniversary rally to be attended by as many as half a million people would take place in Kuala Lumpur in a stadium with a seating capacity of only 60,000. That tension had reached the climax on October 18th of uh, 1987. And uh, with the uh, with the uh, what they call the wild shooting uh, by this uh, private, you know, the uh, uh, this army chap, private Adam. Uh, but when Adam was caught uh, on the 18th, uh, the tension that had built up, especially in Kuala Lumpur, uh, when people realized, when people started to realize that uh, you know the, the shooting of uh, the wild shooting of the private Adam had nothing to do with uh, race or, or uh, anything political, uh, the tension, in fact, subsided very quickly. Not only in KL but throughout the country. Oh, there was a heightening of racial tension, but but it's something that could have been easily been diffused by the government if it acted positively. In passing the ISA, the Malaysian Parliament delegated immense authority to the executive in the person of the Minister of Home Affairs, who also happens to be the Prime Minister. It allows him to detain a person without trial for renewal periods of up to two years at a time. What all this means is that a person can be detained indefinitely without trial. Uh, we have introduced this law was all day today under the uh, Internal Security Act uh, to curb the activity and bring an end to the atrocity committed by the service. But the law under uh, ESA was used by us to deal only with the corporate service, but never had to be used against the ordinary citizens of this country, <laughs> against the political uh, uh, 
aggression uh, against religious bodies, against the ordinary man. Ever from the beginning until now, every government that has been ruling this country has resorted to the internal security act to move against people whom it perceives as dangerous, as a threat to its monopoly of political power in this country. The victims of such punishment were not only the detainees, but also their families, especially the spouses and the children. The trauma they went through can never be erased from their memories or blotted out from country's history. Everything takes on an air of unreality. Here these extremely polite special bunch officers searching the house for politics as they're only doing their job. And they disappear into the night with your husband. And all the time, he tries to behave normally. When you ask why and receive no satisfactory reply, he tries to behave normally. When you ask when he's going, they cannot tell you. And when you ask when can you see him, they do not know. Can you imagine the range of feelings that you're left with? Dominant overall is fear. Fear of what will happen to your loved one and helplessness as you know not why or where he was taken and your imagination runs dry. Everything we are led to believe we have a constitutional right to is totally undermined. We know who to call if our house is wrong. But when the police are the ones robbing you of your husband, who do you call? I remember standing in the middle of the road at about 2.30 in the morning, wondering what the hell I do next. It's an extremely terrifying experience. Did I tell the threat? Don't you believe it? The struggle for the people is According to me, it's going to be the legacy for his children. Often tell my family and tell many people, or his friends, that he doesn't want his children to sit at his face and say, you know, things weren't going right. Things were going, were going wrong. Why didn't you do anything about it? I'm proud to say that my father is the honorable man with very strong principles, one who puts duty before self and is constantly intent on defending the defenseless. However noble the use of the ISA in the lesser months of last year may have intended to be, it is imperative that my body and the other individuals under detention and who have been unfairly denied their deservingly entitled freedom be immediately released so as to restore the notion of democracy in Malaysia. On the 27th of October last year, the day that proved to be the single most traumatic day in my life, as it was the day I was contentiously and disdainfully divorced from my beloved husband and had to painfully endure that separation for a period that has now extended beyond 13 psychologically exhausting months. My thoughts will never cease to remember that greatest day, as it was also the day on which I developed innate feelings of animacy towards the friend Mahante Rajan, for which I had once great... They made efforts to file writs of habeas corpus. Their efforts to obtain a fair judicial review proved to be futile. Lawyer Li Mengchun says that decisions that are purely subjective and without facts make it virtually impossible to obtain justice in the court. Therefore, it's not a question of whether a legal corpus is an effective remedy or not. It's just a question of how tightly the provision authorizing preventative detention is designed. If the law is designed which authorizes preventative detention, covers all the loopholes, and makes it difficult for the legal to question the validity or legality of the detention, then legal corpus is virtually useless. The Malaysian government has categorically denied any form of abuse or torture. Evidence, however, 
provided in the affidavits of the detainees and also by self-attestations shows beyond a shadow of doubt that there has been both physical and mental torture indulged in by the special branch interrogating officers. The four women who were detained, Chi Heng Ling, Irene Xavier, Lin Chin Chin, and Cecilia Ng, talk about their arrest and treatment under detention. It was about 1.30 a.m. and I was, I just got to bed um, and I heard a voice at my gate <coughs> uh, telling me to open the door. So uh, I looked out of the window and I saw that there was this policeman with uh, several other plain clothes men and one woman. Uh, I was Quite, uh, I was, I was quite uh, taken aback, and I didn't really know what to do. So I opened the door and allowed them to come in, and they said that they were uh, here to arrest me uh, under the ISA. I told them that I wanted to make a phone call to my family and to my lawyer, but they did not uh, allow me to do that. He came in with a stick that day and he told me right at the start of the session that he was going to beat me and he said because I had withheld information and he said it doesn't matter now whether you tell us or you don't tell us even if you tell us you're still going to beat you anyway this is to teach you a lesson because you know you have been taking us for a ride kind of thing and uh, so he built up um, his own temple, actually. So I had to you know, sit there and watch him building himself into a frenzy first. And then he started uh, eating me. And uh, I mean, for me, that was a very shocking experience because I've never been beaten before. He stabbed me repeatedly uh, like that for a uh, short period and he pulled my hair and uh, and while he stood behind me uh, ordered me to take off my blouse uh, which I did there was one um, woman officer staying in front of me I think that was uh, the session during which they in- intimidated me I was very nervous, very, very highly tense throughout uh, the 60 days, but well, I guess more so in the beginning. And I remember the uh, first week, I hardly ate at all. They, they thought that I was going on a hunger strike. Uh, I was uh, very nauseous throughout. And I could see, you know, I could feel my nerves, you know, just um, sort of at the snack could just you know, go off like that. I was actually afraid of going eating, you know, going to the And, um, I mean, this feeling was in the interrogation room as well as when I was alone in myself. I uh, just fear that you know, I would just let go of everything and just spill out everything or, you know, um, just or talk nonsense or just you know, keep quiet and kind of reach a point of no return, so to say. And that was my fear, really. I think like Jin I too was uh, very afraid of losing control. Um, I was subjected to very intense pressure and very intense inter- interrogation. And um, the special branch uh, led me to believe or suggested to me that uh, they were going to make me uh, quote unquote break. I think to use that terminology. And, uh, what this breaking point is, I wasn't too sure it was. Uh, I, I was uncertain, and uh, but they made me believe that uh, it was a point at which I would uh, lose control of myself and I didn't uh, know what I was doing. I was very afraid of that. Um, there was even a point in time when they led me to believe that they would inject chemicals into my body. In my case, they... Um they threatened me see, to put me immediately in a, a 
two weeks at least you know, in a completely dark room you know, where uh, nobody I will you know, I won't know day from night I've been no contact with nobody at all and uh, you know, and that people have been known to uh, break you know, or to go mad and that it was my choice to see whether I want to come out of this a whole experience, a whole a sane person, or whether I want to come out with insane, the choice was mine. They would suggest very subtly uh, by saying that, uh, you know, we've had uh, a detainee before and we subject her, her to total deprivation. We didn't give her any food, any drink. She had to do her, her toilet uh, where, wherever she was. She menstruated without a single stitch on her. Etc. Etc. Or about this other lady that we, you know, did this and this to her later. We, you know, put her on a table, make her tickle her with a feather from head to toe. So it wasn't like uh, they were. They, they didn't say we are going to do this to you. They they, they led me to believe uh, that it was possible that they could do all these kinds of things to me because they have done it to other people before. And at that time, I really believed them because uh, I was in a situation when I was uh, totally helpless. I was totally dependent on them for my food, for going to the toilet, and especially for seeing my family. Uh, there was always the, the underlying threat that they would not allow me to see my family or anybody else. <laughs> The family members of the detainees were drawn together by the common angle. They met regularly and shared their experiences and both strength and solidarity through mutual support and understanding. I am Teresa Xavier, mother of Patricia Lutsairi. I want to say a few words about how I felt about the detention of my daughter. It is difficult for me to express in words the empathy, the loneliness and the helplessness that I felt when my daughter was arrested and detained. I was shocked when I was told that my daughter was arrested in Singapore. I was even more saddened when I heard the official reasons for the arrest of my daughter. She was involved in a Marxist conspiracy to overthrow the government. <laughs> the white paper said this. It is painful for me to hear these accusations because I know that they are not true. My daughter has been involved in helping poor people. I have personally met many of these people myself, and judging from what these people tell me, Irene was really helping, helping them, and they appreciated what she did. I'm glad and proud of the fact that Irene chose to make a commitment to the poor in her life. For the Past 354 days when she was detained, my life has been one long ordeal. I began to withdraw from people and found consolation only in prayer and in the support I received from concerned people. I'm singing and I think it And of course our families will suffer because of their loved ones. I'm sure those who are responsible for the detention of these detainees to know they have their own family. How would they feel or their family feel that is presuming they are closely knitted? If they are denied the right to see their loved ones, so it's only natural that we as families should show our concern to our loved ones. Or maybe Mr. Mahathir does not understand the meaning of a family unit. On the very first night of the arrest, 11 NGOs got together and formed a support group. It promptly issued statements to the local press and international agencies and organizations and kept the family members informed. International support was overwhelming in the form of letters and telegrams and pressure on the Malaysian government. 
The Family Group produced a detainee family solidarity newsletter that updated all developments. Although there was a strong spirit of determination and hope, Dr. Tan Kikun was trying to prepare the family members for the worst possible. As you know, this interrogation will last for two months, after which they will all be served with the detention order of two years or they will be released. But nevertheless, I would say that you, the relatives of the detainees, should not build too much hope on their release. As far as I can see, those that are released have been already released, and those who has not released, we should not build too much hope on their being released from <coughs> the two months of interrogation. Although about half of the detainees were released before the end of the 60-day period, that is, 55 unconditionally and 10 conditionally, the rest, about 40 of them, were served with a renewable detention order for two years on Christmas Day 1987 after a gruel 60 days. They were sent to a detention camp in the north. It's called the Kamunting Detention Camp out in the country, occupying a huge piece of land at the foothills of Taiping, a town in the north of Para. Here the detainees were allowed one family visit a week and meet legal counsel. The conditions were somewhat relaxed. They were quartered in small groups and no longer in solitary confinement. Seven months later, the first few were released. Cecilia Ng and Lin Chin Chin were among the first seven released on the 3rd of June, 1988. Xi <laughs> 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 Heng Ling, Chao Chi Kyung, Chan Ka Kim, for release on the 27th of August, 1988. Irene Luth Xavier and Sybil John Joseph were released in October 1988. Sarpal Singh's habeas corpus was heard in the High Court of Ipoh. He was released and re-arrested. One year after the detention, 17 of them were still at Kamunting detention camp. These people made a concerted effort to protest their continued detention having on a hunt truck for each. In concert with their actions, the family members of the detainees, together with friends and supporters, gathered together at the Lake Garden in Kuala Lumpur to spend a day in peaceful fasting to publicly show their solidarity with their loved ones in detention. It was a peaceful morning until the special branch gathered on the scene, backed up by an armed riot squad. The group let off balloons and the police pounced on them. How do you feel about this, Anne? I wasn't told I was under arrest. There were about six women and two men pulling and shoving me, pulling and shoving me, not letting me walk by myself. Yes, they hurt me. They pulled my arms all red and they were pushing from behind. I couldn't keep my feet. And I wasn't told why. It's a very frightening experience. I think the worst part of it is uh, that my children, I didn't know what would happen to my children. First of all, they arrested my husband and I never knew why. 
A lawyer, Mr. Nyao, who confronted the police, said, Now, under the law, under the Constitution, nobody can do that, even the police. Dr. Kwa Kya Sung was released on the 14th of January. On the 26th of January, Dr. Muhammad Nasser was released. The last two to be released were DAP Secretary General Lin Kit Siang and his son Lin Guan Eng on the 19th of April 1989.